records. The underlying principle in our guidance is that record content produced or published by agencies on the web must continue to be managed in compliance with NARA's records management guidance. The fact that agencies have increased their involvement with the Web 2.0 platforms does nothing to change that fundamental principle. However, NARA does realize that Web 2.0 platforms raise additional records management questions. As a means of exploring these potential records management questions, we undertook a detailed evaluation involving dozens of discussions with agencies of the evolving nature of both the Web and federal agencies' use of emerging Web 2.0 capabilities. NARA's subsequent Web 2.0 guidance and activities build on the research foundation established in this evaluation. The interactive nature of Web 2.0 platforms presents un present a number of new factors for agencies to consider. For instance, agencies need to determine if the interactive nature of the content creation, such as comments left on an agency blog, need to be documented as part of the record. They also need to determine if the frequent update of the content requires additional strategies to capture the records. These determinations will impact how agents, agencies properly manage and schedule their records of their Web 2.0 interactions. NARA will soon issue a bulletin that will provide additional guidance and information to agencies about Web 2.0 and social media platforms and how agency use of them may impact records management procedures. We're also conducting a study of federal agencies that are actively using Web 2.0 technologies in order to gain a greater understanding of what records are being created and their potential value, both to agencies and NARA. Both the bulletin and study will be completed and made available this fall. As the subcommittee knows, the core of NARA's mission is public access to information. Web 2.0 tools are allowing us to fulfill that mission in exciting new ways that are already improving external and internal communication and collaboration. NARA is currently using new media tools to support more than 60 live projects. Some examples are in my written testimony, including my own blog, where I regularly report on a variety of issues. Finally, as an agency that not only archives federal records but creates them, I'd like to touch on what we're doing to manage our own records created with social media tools. Rules of behavior for using Web 2.0 and social media websites and responsibilities for content management is the title of our internal guidance. Under this guidance, staff responsible for a Web 2.0 project are directed to assess the record value of the at the proposal stage to determine if the social media activities will create or maintain federal records. NARA's records management staff assist in making this determination. To support this guidance, the manager of a Web 2.0 proposal is directed to answer two records questions. Will the proposed social media be used to create or maintain data or information meeting the statutory definition of a federal record? And if yes, how will the records, drafts, and other products from this project be captured and managed during their entire retention period? The records portion of the guidance explains that records created and maintained in social media may be covered in the NARA record schedule and or the general record schedule and should be managed in accordance with approved dispositions. The biggest challenge in establishing this guidance or determining the boundaries of social media records, for example, is the record the whole site or just a portion? And determining the best ways to capture the record content in a format that maintains the content context and structure and is sustainable over the long term. What we are learning in regard to managing our NARA Web 2.0 records will be shared as best practices on NARA's Open Government website. Web 2.0 offers opportunities unimaginable a decade ago, and I'm personally excited that NARA is taking advantage of its capabilities to increase awareness and provide better access to our holdings, while at the same time working with agencies to ensure that new types of historic records are preserved for future generations. Thanks again for the opportunity to testify, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much, um, uh, Mr. Ferriario. Uh, Dr. McClure. Thank you, Ms. Norton, and welcome to members of the subcommittee. Thank you for having me. Can I just say that the, the, the chairman, real chairman, will be back shortly. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here uh, to testify before you on the use of Web 2.0 tools in the government and how GSA is uh, helping to enable this transformation. My written statement is full of examples of how social media and Web 2.0 technology is being used in the federal government, but today I just want to make three primary points to the subcommittee.
First, I want to emphasize that the use of Web 2.0 tools is essential for responding to shifting citizen expectations of government. Web-based social networks play an increasingly central role in the lives of citizens. For instance, YouTube has become the second largest search engine in the world. Over 300 billion pieces of content are shared on Facebook each year. MySpace, YouTube, Facebook host 250 million visitors, 80 percent of the U.S. population each month. And these statistics, I think, just provide a glimpse into how Web 2.0 is altering how citizens both produce and consume informationally. Increasingly, citizens are expected to find the information they want and need through web-based social networks. They use more and more of them every day. They expect government not only to deliver services through multiple channels, but to engage with them on how these services are working and can be improved. Connecting citizens and government is not new to GSA, and our administrator, Martha Johnson, has placed open government at the center of our mission agenda. In response, we have delivered an apps.gov storefront to help connect agencies with social media tools meeting federal-friendly terms of service. We are creating a challenge.gov website, a web government-wide challenge and contest platform to open up innovation and problem solving. And through our Web Manager University, we have supported and trained over 18,000 agency customers in areas like plain language and user-centered design for web content. So GSA is delivering significant Web 2.0 efficiencies by establishing tools for government-wide use, sharing agency policies, and building communities that extend across the government. My second point is that Web 2.0 is a mission enabler for government. It's easy to think of Web 2.0 as a novelty or something that occurs along the real business of government. However, government's use of social media is extraordinary and it's very diverse. Its use should be aligned directly with the efficiency, effectiveness, and quality of core government functions and programs. I've highlighted several examples in my written statement for you, such as the Library of Congress, the U.S. Geological Survey, the State Department, and TSA's Idea Factory, just to give you an example of many of the innovative uses of Web 2.0 technologies. These efforts show that Web 2.0 isn't fundamentally about technology itself, but it's how technology is enabling people to come together in new ways and achieve dramatic results. Point number three, successful engagement with citizens must be built on a foundation of transparent government. The Open Government Directive contains specific direction for making government more open to citizens and enabling them to hold us accountable. New data releases in areas such as Medicare diagnostic procedures and charges, educational system revenues and standardized scoring outcomes, social security adjudication processing have virtually unlocked unprecedented transparency and accountability uh, for the citizens of this country. Using Web 2.0 technologies, GSA is supporting two key initiatives, data.gov, a central portal for citizens to discover, download, and access over 270,000 government data sets, and usspending.gov, which lets the public visualize how their tax dollars are being spent. We've also redesigned the government's main citizen internet portal, usagov and gobierno.gov, with mobile applications to expand the real-time service delivery of information and services to the public. In closing, I hope we've shed some light in the statement on federal agency adoption of Web 2.0 and GSA's work in encouraging it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I look forward to answering questions. Thank you, Dr. McClure. Uh, Mr. Wilhausen. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify at today's hearing on federal use of Web 2.0 technologies. These technologies refer to a second generation of the World Wide Web as an enabling platform for web-based communities of interest, collaboration, and interactive services. Internet-based services using these technologies include blogs, social networking sites, video websites, and wikis. These tools provide flexible, sophisticated capabilities for interactions among individuals. Among the general public, these services have become quite popular and federal agencies are increasingly using them as well. At Chairman Clay's request, 
we are initiating, initiating a review of agency procedures for managing and protecting information associated with the federal use of social media services, such as Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Our work is just beginning in this area, and we plan to work closely with the subcommittee staff as we review, as our review progresses. Today, however, I will discuss the ways federal agencies are using Web 2.0 technologies and the challenges associated with their use. But first, if I may, I would just like to recognize the contributions of three members of my team who helped prepare this statement and will be leading this review. It's John DeFerrari, Mario Cruz, and or Marisol Cruz, and, and uh, Nick Marino sitting behind them. Most federal agencies are using Web 2.0 technologies to enhance interactions with the public. We determined that 22 of the 24 major federal agencies have a presence on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Federal web managers use these applications to connect to pe with people in new ways. For example, the U.S. Agency for International Development uses Facebook to inform the public about the developmental and humanitarianism humanitarian assistance that it provides to different countries. It also posts links to other USAID resources including blogs, videos, and relevant news articles. NASA uses Twitter to notify the public about the status of its missions as well as to respond to questions about regarding space exploration. And the State Department uses YouTube and other video technologies in support of its uh, public diplomacy efforts. While the use of Web 2.0 technologies can transform how federal agencies engage the public in the governing process, agency use of such technologies can also present challenges related to privacy, security, and records management. One such challenge is determining requirements for preserving Web 2.0 information as federal records. A key question is whether information exchanged through these technologies constitutes federal records pursuant to the Federal Records Act. Another challenge is establishing mechanisms for preserving this information as federal records once the need to preserve information has been established. A third challenge is ensuring that agencies take appropriate steps to limit the collection and use of personal information through social media. Federal agencies have taken steps to identify and start addressing these and other Web 2.0 technology issues. For example, NARA has provided updated guidance on managing web-based records and is conducting a study on the impact of more recent web technologies and plans to release additional guidance later this year. GSA has negotiated terms of service agreements with several social networking providers that addresses concerns agencies had with the terms and conditions generally provided by those providers. And OMB has recently issued guidance intended to help agencies protect privacy uh, you when using third-party websites and applications. In summary, federal agencies are increasingly using Web 2.0 technologies to enhance services and interactions with the public. However, determining the appropriate use of these technologies poses new questions about the ability of agencies to protect the privacy and security of sensitive information and to manage, preserve, and make available official government records. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my statement. I'd be happy to answer any questions. I thank the, the witness for his testimony. Ms. Simpson, you may, um, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman Clay, uh, Ranking Member uh, McHenry, and members of the committee, thank you for this opportunity to uh, orally introduce my written remarks into the record. I'm uh, John M. Simpson, a consumer advocate with Consumer Watchdog, a nonprofit, nonpartisan uh, public interest group founded in 1985. I am the director of our Google Privacy and Accountability Project. Frankly, I wish this were a hearing into Google's recent Y spying activities where they snooped on home Wi Fi networks around the world. We have called for congressional hearings into the scandal and I respectfully repeat that request today. I, I believe that the House Energy and Commerce Committee would have primary jurisdiction, but I think a very strong case could be made that your committee has appropriate oversight. But we're here today to talk about Web 2.0, and that's what I'm testifying about. Um, Web 2.0 technologies or services like Google's YouTube, Facebook, 
Twitter, blogs, and the like. I'd briefly like to make three points. First, as I saw personally when I took vacation time to campaign for Barack Obama in Missouri, Web 2.0 tools are powerful indeed. It is no surprise that they have been adopted by federal agencies. They certainly improve government transparency, responsiveness, and citizen involvement. I think they are particularly attractive to young people. All this is to the good. Second, on the downside, many of these technologies raise substantial concerns about and challenges to consumers' privacy. Given the appalling track record of Facebook and Google, in this area, and one only need to think of why spy and the launch of Google Buzz or Facebook's unilateral revision of privacy policies to understand that these companies do not have consumer privacy high on their list of priorities. Third, and this brings us to the crux of the dilemma where the federal agencies are involved. Federal agency, of use web, uh, federal agency use of Web 2.0 techniques implies a government endorsement of many of these companies. Because this may lull consumers into trusting such sites far more than they should, it is even more imperative that Congress enact robust online privacy laws to protect privacy and other rights. And I'm delighted to note that there's another hearing before another committee right now uh, discussing stronger privacy legislation. That is a very good thing. In conclusion, Web 2.0 techniques offer government agencies powerful and valuable tools. They should be used carefully, however, without unduly favoring a particular provider, and there must be explicit warnings when a consumer leaves an official government site to go to one of the third-party sites. Most importantly, however, Congress must enact meaningful privacy legislation to safeguard consumers as they use these online services that have become known as Web 2.0. I look forward to answering any of your questions. Thank you very much. I thank the witness and thank all the witnesses for their testimony. We are in the middle of a series of votes, but we will try to get to two questionnaires. Uh, and we'll start with Mrs. Norton of the District of Columbia. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Chairman. Before I ask my question, I do want to note a, a, a searing uh, hearing I, I recall um and in preference in 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 preface to a question i'm going to ask it was about two years ago it was a full committee hearing on the bush administration's electronic record preservation uh it was almost a scandalous hearing the uh minority defended at the hearing it was a hearing of record the Bush administration's use of non-federal email systems, such as the Republican National uh, Committee's emails. No one can forget it because among the, the most notorious use of these emails, now lost forever, uh, was Karl Rove himself. Our, my very good friend and the ranking member uh, of the committee at this time, at that time, and uh, Mr. Issa asked the general counsel of the National Archives if the use of personal email account was inappropriate for official business. Uh, now the answer was no, that the actual use of a personal email for official government building business was not a violation of the law. Uh, the email simply uh, had to be placed into the record keeping system. That is what would satisfy the requirements of law. That was what was never done by 88 White House officials led by Carl Rove himself. In light of that past practice, let me uh, ask Mr. Ferriero, what is the current policy on archiving websites? Uh, are any of, of, of those permanent? 
Your question is specifically about websites. Yeah, well, websites first. Emails of the kind I mentioned. The, 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 um, the policy around emails has not changed. Um, on so the would you state on, it? On the Federal Records Act or the Presidential Records Act that people are free to use external email accounts as long as those emails are captured for the agencies or the White House's own records management system. Is that system being followed as far as you know? As far as I know. Now, with 2.0, Web 2.0, uh, aren't there new challenges uh, presented to comply with the Records Management Act, was not complied with at all in the last administration. Now you say, as far as you know, it is being complied with, but now we got 2.0. How are you managing to do that? Every, every new technology presents new challenges to the basic definition of what is a record. And the guidance that we are have already issued and continue to issue as we work with the agencies helps them clarify, helps the agencies clarify exactly what needs to be captured, how long it has to be retained, and eventually what comes to the archives as permanent record. Uh, Dr. McClure, ask, let me ask you a question about uh, privacy. Um, uh, Carl Rove and the 88 White House officials apparently weren't concerned about <laughs> privacy because they simply took their personal emails with them. They were never archived. Do you have concerns about the privacy of the content of, of government 2.0 sites now that everybody is going to be on these sites and, and emails like uh, Carl Rove's emails um, would have to be archived? Well, I think in uh, reference to the Web 2.0 or social media tools, our expectation at GSA and for any tool that we put up for government-wide use, uh, it adheres to the Privacy Act and to privacy impact assessment requirements before we will accept the product or Meaning use the Meaning what? It. It's got to go through a test, a test of, of uh, data collection to understand how privacy or uh, information that's considered Well, suppose personal. you receive Mr. Mr. Rove's uh, emails. How would that go through and be managed? If it were, to, if you, if that policy had been followed, then as it was not. Well, I think the the email area is a, is a, is a little bit different because it covers email transfer and receivable and receipt receipt and what is sent on an official government system versus what is a private account that you have with a third party provider. Um, so emails. Can well, the be provider received. it was done right on the, uh, it was done right on the White House account. Mm -hmm. So I don't know who the third party provider here. The White House was. <laughs> essentially uh, the account being used. Right, right. Well, when, again, government employees, uh, both uh, appointees as well as uh, uh, civil service officials, have to still comply with, uh, this is where we get into this distinction between ethics rules and uh, the use of technology rules. So that's, I think, what causes these issues to get blurred quite a bit. All right, so you just shouldn't use, you shouldn't use the White House system, are you saying? for such emails? Or are you saying if you use them, do understand that it is our obligation to archive them? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. And you do understand that they were not archived at all. Millions upon millions of personal emails were lost during the Bush administration when, uh, according to testimony uh, before this committee, at least 88 White House officials used the White House system for personal emails. Now, if that happened in the Bush White House, those would have to be archived. time has expired. Those would have to be archived if that happened in, in, the, in the Obama White House. Uh, I yield back the balance thank of my you. time. The gentleman from North Carolina is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you know, I, I, I think uh, we have this long-term discussion about presidential records. I mean, I, look, um, you know, I, the Bush White House, they had their, their folks with outside email accounts. It's apparent this White House has the same thing. Um, it's apparent that the high-ranking political officials in the Clinton White House the Bush, and the Bush White House had political accounts in order to discuss political travel. I would uh, raise the question of if Mr. Axelrod or Mr. Emanuel have those very same types of accounts in this administration. Uh, but, Dr. Ferrier, 
the Presidential Records Act applies to all documented, uh, documentary material created or received by the President, his immediate staff, or a unit or individual of the Executive Office of the President. The, o the White House Office of Science and Technology is part of the Executive Office of the President. Uh, Mr. Ferrio, uh, why does the Presidential Records Act not apply to the Office of Science and Technology? Oh, sorry. Um, all I know is that that office is covered by the Federal Records Act and not the Presidential Records Act. And I'm sure I have legal counsel behind me. I'm sure they can explain the history of that. Okay. Um, now, for instance, if, if someone within that department is a, is a part of a presidential decision, would those emails be subject to the Presidential Records Act? If they're presidential records, if the President's direct staff were involved, then those records would be, yes. Okay. But the um, OSTP's staffers' email would be covered by the Federal Records Act. Okay. Now, uh, we're currently working under uh, a 2008, um, uh, 2008 uh, NARA uh, conducted an evaluation of federal agencies' use of the Web.20 uh, technologies. We're currently w operating under um, a 2006 guidance, in essence, for the federal government. Is that correct? Um, I believe it's 2009. Okay. And about to be, and new guidance about to be released uh, this fall. Yes, at the end of this year. Right. Okay. Um, all right, Mr. Simpson. Um, on January 21st, 2009, the President signed an executive order requiring every appointee to sign a pledge to refrain from participating, quote, in any particular matter involving specific parties that is directly and substantially related to my former employer or former clients, including and regulating, uh, including and regulating contracts. This uh, lobbying ban must also be followed by all members of the executive branch. So, uh, Mr. McLaughlin's uh, uh, communications with his ex-colleagues at Google suggests that he communicated regularly and often with Google about, for instance, net neutrality, China, copyright policy and intellectual property rights, privacy regulation, and Internet governance. Now, this was released as a matter of uh, your uh, group's Freedom of Information Act about uh, his emails in, in this case. Is that correct? We opposed his nomination from the beginning because we thought it was inappropriate for an industry lobbyist, specifically a Google lobbyist, to uh, have that position. Uh, when it, uh, he got the position, uh, I decided to put in a FOIA request to obtain uh, his um, emails, uh, both on his White House account and on private accounts, and the result of that was the documents that you were referring to. Okay. Um, now, uh, do you know of any other particular uh, any other particular policy matters directly or substantially related to Mr. McLaughlin's uh, and his relationship with his former employer? So all I know is what was released in the FOIA uh, as a result of the FOIA request. Okay. Um, you've, in your written testimony, you raised concerns about some Web.20 technology providers could have too close a relationship with federal agencies. Uh, can you expand on these concerns? Well, I, mean, I, I do think that um, Google specifically has perhaps too close a relationship with the government. I think it's worked very hard to do that. I think Mr. McLaughlin's appointment is one of those ties that's inappropriate. But I also think that there are other ones. I mean, the sort of revolving door policy that they have of uh, hiring lobbyists, say one of their top people happens to be Pablo Chavez, who used to be uh, the uh, counsel to uh, uh, Senator McCain. So, I mean, this is, this is a sad commentary, if you will, on um, the revolving door in, in Washington. And I'm particularly upset about how Google has been able to uh, insinuate itself into that process, and I have opposed, along with my colleague from the Center for Di uh, Digital Democracy, uh, Mr. McLaughlin's appointment from the beginning. The gentleman's time has expired. For the record and for the committee's information, uh, there are two categories uh, in the executive office of the president that come under different controlling statutes. Uh, and in the executive office of the president, the entity subject to the Federal Records Act 
of the Council on Environmental Quality, Office of Management and Budget, Office of National Drug Control Policy, Office of Science and Technology Policy, and the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative. And that's for, um, in accordance with FOIA. Uh, in the other category of entities in the, uh, that come under the Presidential Records Act, in the Executive Office of the President, the White House Office, the Office of Administration, the Office of the Vice President, Council of Economic Advisors, National Security Council, Office of Policy Development, uh, and under those, that office is the Domestic Policy Council, Office of National AIDS Policy, National Economic Council, and the President's Foreign Intelligence Advisory Board. And so that kind of breaks down the categories of which statutes apply to which offices. And with that, we will recess until the end of these votes. The, the committee stands in recess.